While we do not certainly uphold because of the teaching of the scriptures, December 25th is Christ's birthday. One of the great things about our country is that we enjoy this as a season of family gathering, a season of enjoying each other, and it's always good to do that. And we hope and wish for everybody a wonderful season of happiness, time to get together and enjoy each other. And in view of Ken's comments, especially the Cone family, <laughs> I think I noticed Keith already getting his phone out and saying, if this is going to be the way it is, I'm getting an uh, early uh, flight back to California. <laughs> We've been talking about marriage, then we talked about divorce and remarriage. And in talking about it, I mean we have studied what the Bible says about it. We wouldn't know anything about marriage, the home, divorce, remarriage, as far as the right view of it, except that the Bible tells us. The home is an invention of God for the good of man. But like anything God comes up with, man by his teaching, his thinking, can pervert it, can pollute it, and can thereby ruin it. And what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is looking at false doctrines that have come up and been used by those, many of the members of the Lord's church, to try to justify getting around what is taught plainly in Matthew 19, 6 and verse 9 of that chapter. We want to look at an argument today that I don't know exactly what you would call it other than the emotional argument. And it's sometimes set forth by those who wish to defend unscriptural divorced and remarried couples. Of course, the idea being that they can remain in that relationship. And they try to make their case in this way. Our God is a God of love and grace and mercy. And any time I hear somebody starting out like that, I want to stop and say, what do you mean by love, grace, and mercy? And that's about as far as it gets. Because, you see, this is an emotional argument. And usually their concept of religion is emotional. Long time ago, I was visiting with Brother Tom Warren, and he made the statement. We were in a private visit. He said, David, do not fall victim to romanticism. Now, in philosophy, there is the philosophy of romanticism. And it's fundamentally just an emotional way of determining what you think God wants you to do and what you think is wrong and pretty much it allows you to do whatever you want to do as long as you have a good warm feeling about it that warm feeling means god says that's fine you're a good boy now it gets a lot more involved in that when you get into the philosophical studies but that's basically what's happened to a great many people so when they say god is a god of love and grace and mercy they'll go ahead and attach to that that as such he would not demand the breaking up of a home and the separation of parents from children. Then they'll say, to demand such would have God actually requiring divorces. Well, when you hear that use of divorce, then you know they're giving a human definition of divorce because they have a human concept of marriage that lets you do with it any way, pretty much, that any human desires just so two can remain in what they call a husband-wife relationship. So this argument has great appeal to many people who don't understand the nature of God. And they don't understand, therefore, the purpose of God's laws. God is indeed a God of mercy, but I better know what the Bible tells us about that mercy. But he's also a just God, and I better understand that about God. He is a just God. When you say God is love, you can also say equally well without contradiction, God is justice. 
He must be just in order to rule the universe. It must not be overlooked that God is also a God of wrath. Have you noticed that the people that talk about God is love? Yes, they're stating that which is true about God, but I wonder what's going on up here when they say God is love. And unless they tell you, it's hard to figure out until you see what they practice in the name of that God whom they say is a God of love. But God's a God of justice. God is a God of wrath. Does that mean he is a self-contradicting person? No, it all fits. That wrath fits with his love. That justice fits with his love. His justice is shown in his demand, not suggestion but his demand that his laws be obeyed. You can study the Old Testament in the patriarchal system. You can study the Old Testament in the system of the Jews, the Moses uh, system, if you please. And you can study the New Testament under the Christian system. And he always demands that his laws be obeyed. That doesn't uh, contradict that God is a God of mercy and love and kindness and tenderness doesn't contradict it at all. If we understood the nature of God, we'd see all of those fit together just perfectly. So his mercy and love are shown that he's willing to forgive those, to forgive those who have broken his law and has provided the means of forgiveness through his son Jesus Christ of the gospel system. His wrath will be revealed against those who willfully persist in violating his law and they have not sought forgiveness on his terms through the gospel system, that is, through Jesus Christ. Listen to what we have in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. We ought to have this in our minds as to the principles as recorded here. And please keep in mind this is written to members of the Lord's Church, Christians. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Should I behold one and neglect the other? The Holy Spirit didn't say so. Look at, behold, see, therefore, the light of all he's been saying earlier the goodness and severity of God. Now watch, on them which fell, severity. But toward thee, that's the church, goodness. But watch the conditional promise. If, if thou continue in his goodness, what's going to happen if you don't? Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. To the church that's written, to those who heard the gospel, believed it, from the heart obeyed it, Romans chapter 6. Who were added to the church by the Lord himself, who remitted their sins in the waters of baptism. But he still says this. And that ought to tell us then why he will teach elsewhere, as did the Corinthians, he who thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. There must be a constant examination of our lives to make sure we're continuing in the straight and narrow way of divine truth. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Then when you look at Paul writing to Christians, and they were persecuted greatly by unbelieving Jews and Gentiles, he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch the state of those people throughout all eternity who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What about those who die in the faith? What about those who would die rather than give up obeying God when He shall come to be glorified in His saints? and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, 
in that day. We must have a full picture of God as God reveals himself to us, and that's only in the Bible. Now, we've already noted the way of the transgressor is hard, Proverbs 13, 15. We've already emphasized that true biblical repentance that's required of all people in order to be saved from their past sins and of any child of God who sins in order to be forgiven as a child of God and God's second law of pardon, that repentance is itself difficult. I have emphasized countless times that I think it's far more difficult to get people to repent by understanding fully what the New Testament teaches about repentance than it is to get them to believe that baptism is for the remission of sins. If you look at what it really says, it's simply saying, I'm no longer going to have my will done. My will has gotten me into the mess I'm in with God. My doing as I please has gotten me at odds with God. It's caused me to transgress His law. So I am going to stop that. I'm going to form a view that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Commanded, I will obey in all things. And that's going to be the goal the rest of my life. So true repentance requires that one must come out of a sinful relationship. Now we're concentrated on a sinful marriage here. But you can take any relationship, any situation, and if it is wrong, as God defines the wrong, you have to come out of it or you have not repented. We have an example in the Old Testament of where marriages were made by God's people, the Jews, who were approaching God under their authority, God's authority, the law of Moses, and they made marriages that were not lawful. And the question you ask at this point is, well, what was God's attitude toward them? Of course, they involved children in those marriages. And you have to say, well, did God turn a blind eye to his law when it came to there being children in those marriages? You say, that's all right. I know that work a hardship on you. Well, I think we need to know how he dealt with them. Now, how many times have we read Paul's writing again to the church at Rome as he gets toward the end of the book in Romans 15, 4? Whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And to the Corinthians, he reminded them in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, that all of that punishment that came upon the children of Israel and their rebellion in the wilderness wandering was an example to us. Don't be like them. You see what happened to them. Well, had they not obeyed Moses and being baptized in the cloud and in the sea? Yes, they did. Were they freed from Egyptian bondage, a type of being freed from, uh, freed from alien sins? Indeed, they were. But the Scripture said God was not well pleased with them because as the church in the wilderness, they're like the real church of our Lord today as fleshly Israel, and many of them did not continue faithfully. When God gave the land of Canaan to Israel, He told them to destroy utterly the people of the land. Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 3. He also said, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. And you can see more of this in Joshua 23, 11 through 13. However, what happened? Well, in spite of this very plain teaching, over a period of years, many of the Israelites intermarried with the people of the land. And after hundreds of years of rebellion, 
prophets sent to them, repentance, rebellion, prophets sent to them, and on and on we go. God had enough. And he destroyed Judea and Jerusalem and the temple and sent them all off for 70 years vacation in Babylon. And of course, that burned idolatry out of them. Now they got into many other sins when the remnant finally came back between then and the time Jesus came. They didn't have any problems with idolatry after that. Somebody says, you know, you beat the stuff inside of somebody. God beat the idolatry out of them. He didn't want to have to do it that way. He took hundreds and hundreds of years trying to get the reason with them. But folks, if you set your mind to do evil, guess what you're going to do? You're going to at least attempt it. Now, chapters 9 and 10 of the book of Ezra, and remember Nehemiah and uh, Ezra are dealing with the return of the remnant to Judea and Jerusalem, building of the walls, rebuilding the temple, and so on. So they deal with restoring things according to the law. This, by the way, is one of the proofs that there is a restoration principle, that you can restore ancient, pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity because we have the New Testament pattern and the seed is the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. So when they came back, they had to get things started again like the law taught. The sin of the people in doing this was clearly pointed out by Ezra. That is, the matter of marriage. Listen, listen to what he said. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure. Well, that's a novel idea, isn't it? They've only been told that about 10 trillion times. Now watch what he asked of that. Do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and the strange, which means foreign to the law, strange wives, Ezra 10 verse 11. Is God a God of love? Is God a God of mercy? Is God a God of tender, loving kindness? Yes. But in restoring the law to the remnant that came from Babylonian captivity, here's what the good book said. There were also children involved in these unlawful marriages. Scripture says, and some of them had wives by whom they had children, Ezra 10, 44. But read your book. Nevertheless, God's law was carried out. Was that written before time for our learning? Is there nothing to learn from that that will help me serve God in the New Testament? And especially when it comes to marriage, divorce and remarriage. An unscripturally married couple who have children are teaching their children the strongest possible lesson on God's plan for marriage and the meaning of repentance when they separate in order to conform to God's will. That's how important it is to obey God. And you can almost see brethren going, where's a cross? <laughs> Got to nail him to that cross. You can almost see that, I know better than God on this. That's a shame. Because we're falling victim to the same thing those people did. And it won't stand. And the church is permeated with this stuff throughout the land. And folks seeking ways, and emotional arguments are one of the ways they go, to justify violating, being in disobedience to, transgressing God's law in Matthew 19.9. Responsibilities toward their children can be fulfilled by both parents if they are sincere about pleasing God above all else. Wouldn't it be strange if parents who came to know that they had no authority from God to be in that marriage were to set their children down and say, here's how important it is that we serve God because we're looking forward to that day of eternity where we shall be forever after we've given account of the deeds done in the body to Christ. Your mother and I are going to have to cease to be married. We have no authority from our Lord to be in a marriage union. Wouldn't it be wonderful to say, 
Go and order your lives and don't get yourself into this mess. Because the way of the transgressor is hard. Just like God said. Look at the homes in this country. I hate to even refer to them as homes sometimes. We started many years ago talking about they're just filling stations. I think they're filling stations now that have water in the gasoline. That's why right. it's just worse than ever. There's not much in the way of a home. There's not much security, closeness. Children are raising other children. They haven't grown up themselves. It's been going on for a long time in America. So what can we expect when it comes to people unwilling to sacrifice to have things that ought to be before God even when they must separate for God has not authorized them to be in a marriage union. They weren't qualified to be, but they went ahead and got married anyway. Well, God didn't join them together. Some preacher somewhere or some civil servant somewhere, or it might have said you're pronounced husband and wife, but God didn't tie the knot. You remember back when we started studying this in Matthew 19, 6, it's not just a man and a woman who tie that knot. In fact, it's God that joins them together. I didn't mention this at that time where it says, let not man put asunder. Let there carries the force of a commandment. In the Greek, it also carries the force of, you can try to do it contrary to God's will, but you won't be able to do it. There's only one person that can untie that marriage. And that's when one spouse commits fornication, the innocent spouse puts that one away, God unties the knot. But even the put away guilty party is still bound by the marriage law and only the innocent party can contract a scriptural marriage with somebody else who's eligible for marriage. Well, with the way things are going in the country today and have been for many years, doesn't the truth sound so mean and hateful? Doesn't it really sound mean and hateful? When you, the further you get removed from the truth of God on anything and more people begin to practice things contrary to God's will and everybody's in agreement with it, then when the truth is announced on it, people stand in horror at the truth. And the truth itself becomes, as the scripture says, evil spoken of. And those who teach it become evil spoken of. And thus persecution comes, as Jeff so well taught this morning. We in the Lord's church are determined to be just that. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. The Lord's church and Christians and all that that means. In our day and time, in converting people to Christ and all that the New Testament means by converting them to Christ, must be prepared for these things. And here is a place to attack the idea of emotions just governing everything anyway. Emotions will lead you astray. They always have. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end, there are all the ways of death. Why are those passages in your Bible? And what do you learn from them for your own life? What are you going to teach your children? Those of you who have little children now, what are you going to teach them? What are you going to teach them about marriage, divorce, free marriage? Are you going to warn them about these things? If not, you haven't reared them. You haven't done your duty in rearing them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, so much for the emotional argument. I'd like to look at one now, another argument, if you can call it that. All of them, I said, are designed to get around God's plan of marriage. And it's made from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And this effort is to try to say that God gave an additional reason for divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. That is an additional reason to Matthew 19, 9. Since the Lord sent his Holy Spirit upon his apostles to guide them into all truth. And that was said by Jesus in John 16, 13. They revealed a reason 
for divorce with a right to remarry in addition to that found in Matthew 19, 9. Now that's the reasoning. So you got two reasons. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how thou, um, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? I would pause here and say, have you ever heard from faithful gospel preachers and Bible teachers anything called context? Have you ever realized that Paul is addressing the church and particular problems in that church and even, even answering questions that they put to him about certain matters that were troubling them within that church? What we must recognize is that this does not, in any form or fashion, set aside the teaching of the Lord of Matthew 19, 9. So it must be that this harmonizes with Matthew 19, 9. So in order to understand 1 Corinthians 7, we must look at the context. The Corinthians had written a letter to Paul, let me remind you. And they asked a number of questions, I've already said, and they had to do, some of them, with marriage. And Paul is dealing with those questions. Now, we don't have Paul saying question number one, and he states the question, and he starts answering it. We form the questions by the answers given. We get the idea by the answers given of what the questions were. We must also understand that Paul is answering these questions in the light of a very critical situation that faced Christians at that time. He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. That was a present distress in the presence of 2,000 years ago in Corinth. I say that it is good for a man so to be 1 Corinthians 7, 26. Now in verses 10 and 11, Paul addresses the question of whether already married couples should separate because of that present distress. Now you've got to keep that in mind. Paul's answering these questions in the light of that present distress coming upon them that had to do with persecution, no doubt, of them because they're Christians. He answers no because he says, let not the wife depart from her husband. Let not the husband put away the wife. But should a separation occur, there was no ground for divorce with a right to remarry. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Now how could Paul teach that? When our Lord had already taught in Matthew 19, 9, that if a spouse commits fornication, the one innocent of fornication has a right to put away. And it applies to the whosoever, and that's as broad as the human race when you find people in that condition. In verses 12 through 24, Paul addressed the question of a believer being married to an unbeliever. And no doubt this was the case of many in the Corinthian church. We would do well to ever remind ourselves that marriage is not a church ordinance. Lord's Supper is a church ordinance. Marriage is not a church ordinance. If, if marriage were a church ordinance, every time people were baptized that were married before their baptism, they would have to be married again because it's a church ordinance. And baptism is not a marriage ceremony. It never has been. i had to remind some people of that. Baptism is not a marriage ceremony. It's not a divorce court either, by the way. Marriage does, or rather, baptism does only what baptism does. If you've met the steps preceding baptism, then it'll forgive your sins. But it will not become a divorce court. It doesn't become a marriage ceremony. So people out in the world who never obey the gospel and they're going to hell, they can be married scripturally. When the gospel was preached in Corinth, and it could happen to this day, a husband might accept and obey the gospel. Or a wife might obey the gospel. 
but a wife or a husband might reject it. Likely the Christian partner in such a marriage, thinking, trying to say we want to be sure we do God's will, would ponder and wonder if he or she should remain in such a close, intimate relationship with a non-Christian. Paul plainly taught that the marriage was binding. It's not a church ordinance. You were married before you ever heard the gospel, and you're married now, both of you being eligible for marriage. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. I don't know how you say it any clearer. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. That's verses 12 and 13. So the marriage of a believer and a non-believer was binding because marriage is a universal ordinance. Complete harmony with Matthew 19. Whosoever. How broad is that? Broad is the human race. All men are amenable to God through the law of Christ. God's laws, marriage laws included, apply to everybody. He joins eligible believers in marriage just the same as believers. If this were not the case, I say again, and as the Bible teaches, the children of a marriage between unbelievers or a believer and an unbeliever would be, as he says, unclean. That is, they would be illegitimate. But such was not the case. Paul plainly said that such was not the case. In verse 15, Paul dealt with a case where the unbeliever simply refused to remain with his or her spouse after the spouse had become a Christian. Even though a Christian will make a better marriage partner, no one that knows his Bible denies that because he or she is a better person through obedience to the truth. The Christian can no longer participate in a worldly lifestyle, associate intimately with a worldly crowd, or engage in various heathen festivals and acts of worship. Now, that being the case, the unbeliever might find this change in his or her spouse uncomfortable or intimidating. You're not the man I married. You're not the woman I married. Does that sound kind of familiar? Or intimating that would simply refuse to, some way or another, live with him any longer because of her, because they simply don't do what they used to do. Now, what did Paul say about that? He said in such cases, Christian is not under bondage. In other words, you're not to follow your spouse in order to keep the marriage in committing every kind of sin under the sun. If he or she doesn't like it because you're living the Christian life and they take off, you're not under bondage to that person. Nothing is said here about Matthew 19.9. Nothing is said here about fornication. Now, if fornication comes to bear, Matthew 19.9 comes to bear. But that's not what's being discussed. Folks, we above all people in the church have harped and harped and rightly so on the importance of context. Well, then apply it here. And he's addressing a question. That's why he addresses it the way that he does. So what does the phrase not under bondage mean? Well, some have taken it to mean that one's no longer bound to the marriage bond or tie. And this, in effect, they believe constitutes another reason for divorce in addition to the cause of fornication in Matthew 19, 9, and this is where we've been headed there since I introduced it a moment ago. <clears throat> Some assume that if a pagan left a Christian, given pagan values and the immoral climate of Corinth, that he or she would very soon be involved in fornication. And therefore, verse 15 teaches essentially the same thing as Matthew 19, 9. Not necessarily so. Matthew 19, 9 could come to bear but not necessarily so. There's a possibility somebody just said, I've been married long enough anyway, I don't want that responsibility anymore, I'm out of it. Don't bring another person back into my life. It's been bad enough as it has been. Don't think people don't think that way? Then you haven't been around preachers and dealing with folks in the church and everybody else when it comes to so-called marriage counseling. 
There are others that say it is clearly a second reason for divorce or the right to remarry. Not under bondage, they say, means not bound any longer to the marriage contract. They say, and the they say thing comes out so many times, if one will carefully consider the context, I just don't know how to emphasize that enough. He will see that Paul's saying that marriage, marriages are meant to be permanent, even marriages of unbelievers with believers. And if one departs, then you must remain unmarried or else reconciled to the marriage partner, verse 11. So to what then does the phrase not under bondage refer? It refers to the fact that if one's unbelieving partner refuses to remain with him, you're not, in, you're not under bondage. You're not enslaved to the marriage partner to the extent that he or she must give up Christ in order to keep the marriage intact. There's no sin with anybody anywhere that you do in order to keep certain agreements and partnerships intact, regardless of whether it's marriage or anything else. You don't sin to keep it intact. You may have a, a partnership in a business. And one fellow want to do, the one partner want to do something contrary to God's will. And you can't stop him. Well, are you to give in to him and go ahead and sin with him to keep the partnership going? No. Same thing's true then when it comes to marriage. When you look at Ananias and Sapphira, I don't know who first made that suggestion, but they both agreed to it that uh, they do what they did, which Peter said, you're lying to God, not to men. But wouldn't it have been wonderful, since they were both Christians, if the husband had said, we're not going to do this. As the head of the house, we're going to follow Christ. Just put such stuff out of our minds and just give as we've been prospered. Somebody didn't say that. Well, apply that to any other thing when it comes to serving God. You're tempted to do something. You know it's contrary to God's will. But if you do it, it keeps things all running smoothly. Somebody has to say, I've got to bear my cross, and we're not going to do it because we're not authorized by the New Testament to do it. Let the chips fall where they may. Folks, that attitude's not existing in the church like it once did. And that's the reason we fall victim to so many problems. We're trying to have our cake and eat it too. And some of us who are not in what we call, quote, liberal churches, unquote, those churches that just have thrown off the yoke of God's authority in the New Testament completely, in certain areas of our lives, we try to justify ourselves. Well, you know, I still believe the New Testament's the divine pattern. I still believe that you this, this. But in this one area, God's merciful, God's loving, God's kind, and God will understand. And so we fall victim in one area to where folks have fallen victim in many areas. But how many areas do you have to sin in before you lose your soul? The Greek word which is translated bound in reference to marriage is del. It occurs in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 27 and also in verse 39 as well as in chapter 7 of Romans and verse 2. It means to bind tie or fasten. However, the word translated bondage in verse 15 is from another Greek word, the dulatai. It comes from a root meaning to be enslaved. And it occurs 133 times in the New Testament and is never used in reference to the marriage bond unless 1 Corinthians 7 15 is the only exception and that's highly unlikely. There's a lot of stuff that's been written on this. I couldn't tell you how much there is on it. But I do know that he's answering questions pertaining to believers and unbelievers being married to one another, questions that fit the present distress and the problems it was causing in the church at Corinth 2,000 years ago. And in rightly dividing the word of truth, we must recognize there were some things whereby God gave his truth to us that fit a given situation at that time. 
I would say if you had the same situation arise today and we in the church are having to live through it, then we might understand this better. It's sort of like Paul said, it's better to be single in his situation because when you're married, you have obligations to a wife and a family. And that can, that can be a problem when they throw you in jail for preaching the gospel. Because when you decide to get married, you decide to take upon yourself responsibilities of a husband or a wife. And the New Testament regulates those things and guides them. And that can take away from things that a single person can do. When a man's put into prison because he preaches the truth and he doesn't have a wife and family, he doesn't have them to be concerned about. But imagine being put into prison for preaching the truth and your wife and family is out there. How are they going to live? Especially 2,000 years ago. And that would pose a burden. So Paul says it's better to be this way. And when it comes down to a man being a Christian and a wife being a non-Christian, or vice versa. And one of them doesn't like it because the other one's a Christian. How much, what's my obligation to keep this thing together? Well, not to the point of sinning to keep it together. And if keep that unbeliever there, you've got to sin, let him go. You're not under bondage. Now, if he runs off out here after about a week, you find out he's committing fornication. He's committed fornication. And let me say this concerning, and we'll close it here, the civil law. Civil law is only to be obeyed in anything because it is civil law and it's in harmony first of all with the will of God. Where in the civil law is against God's law, God never said obey it. Never did. And the Bible's full of situations where that's the case. What would we do today? It could happen in some time in the future. You're not to preach any longer that homosexuality is a sin. You know, a few years ago I could say that and people say, oh, I have no problem. Nowadays it's sort of say, well, I can see that possibly coming. Well, then what are we going to do? We're going to violate the law and teach that it is a sin and teach the truth of marriage, divorce, remarriage, male and female, just like we do now. So we need to understand that civil law does not determine who's eligible for marriage or who's divorced and not divorced. It's God that set out his law and joins a man and a woman together to be husband and wife. If civil law determined it, then civil law says a man and a man can get married, a woman and a woman can get married. Then I guess when the Supreme Court rules or some laws made somewhere that that is the case for civil law, God's got to accept it. That's the law of the land. So if you want to change the New Testament, just enact every law you want to contrary to the New Testament. A person can just believe Christ is the Son of God. He doesn't have to be baptized. That becomes the law of the land. Well, it becomes the truth with God. Well, we know better than that. We'll bring it down then to the truth of marriage, divorce, or remarriage. And we'll be able to see it. Is it a trying situation? Yeah, it's a trying situation. When your children go out and do things that are wrong, your parents do it, your brothers and sisters in the flesh do it, and you're a Christian and they claim they're Christians, fellowship ceases, folks, no matter what anybody does or how many wags there are that criticizes you. I'm not going to stand in judgment before you someday. And you're not going to stand in judgment before me. But I can tell you exactly how we're going to give account to God. It's going to be on the basis of the static standard of truth that is the New Testament that will read then and mean then just, what it, just how it reads and means now. And my parents or my whoever in my family, it doesn't make me one whit of difference what they think about what I do because I do from the heart what God said. Well, yeah, but we can't eat Christmas dinner together. Well, I never liked your old bean salad anyway. So... <laughs> <laughs> just adopt a, an attitude and go on and say, if you, if you want to go to hell and I can't stop you, you'll just have to go. But I don't have to go with you. You know what a problem with it is in a lot of things? I wonder how much we really think most people will go to hell. I really wonder. And only very, very few will go to heaven. 
And it's only going to be on the basis of this and a whole lot that's going to go to hell or those that fell victim to the kind of things we've been talking about and still going to talk about that sets aside the truth of God in Matthew 19.6 and Matthew 19.9 that refuses to write the by the word of truth, that refuses to understand the context in which things are discussed, and that refuses to say the Bible, and understood properly, harmonizes in every respect with itself. As we close the lesson, we hope these things would help you study more, make sure you understand, and if you have any questions that aren't fulfilled, we said in the beginning we couldn't cover probably everything that might come to mind, and we might make things come to mind that wouldn't have otherwise, that is, if we hadn't studied this, then you'll feel free to write them down and let us know, because Lord willing, after the first year, we're going to start a question and answer session. Rather, if you're not a Christian, you must obey God rather than man. You must meet the terms of pardon God has set out. There is no hope for man unless he does that because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. You cannot walk up to God and say, I'm going to heaven on my own terms. That's why man's in the mess he's in in the first place. We've studied the plan of salvation. If you need to obey it, now is the time to obey the gospel. Someday, you'll have to stand before the Lord and he's going to mainly, you're going to, you're going to know I had those opportunities to obey the gospel, to be baptized into Christ, but I wouldn't do it. For whatever reason was going on in your mind, you would not do what you knew the New Testament taught, and you remained in your sins. And now you're standing before the judge of all the earth who gave his life for you, who had all authority and does have all authority in heaven and on earth, and who laid down the plan of salvation. But you wouldn't receive it. And he's going to deny you before his father at that time and you'll be ushered off to an eternity of misery beyond the human mind to grasp forever and ever and ever. To those in the church, are you faithful? And all that the New Testament says you're faithful. Or do we fall victim to some of these things and say, well, it won't hurt a little bit here. Or that's my brother and sister in the flesh. And I just hate to... I hate to not go to their house anymore, and I hate to not eat Thanksgiving and Christmas with them anymore, and I just can't turn loose of them. Well, if that's the way you feel, you won't have to turn loose of them, and you can be with them for all eternity in misery, in the fires of eternal torment, because you would not do from the heart what the Lord told you to do. You need to repent of those sins. You've fallen back to the ways of the world. You've gone back to what you said you left when you were baptized. Whatever that sin is, repent of it, confess it, truly pray God for forgiveness, and he'll hear and forgive. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.